Hi, I'm Donna Giroux, the Executive Director of CATV, your local nonprofit media center. And today on A Closer Look, with me today is Jeff, and your last name is ba ba Baylor. Baylor. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> um, so do me a favor and tell us your title. Sure. I'm, uh, again, Jeff Baylor. I'm the director of the U.S. Census Bureau's New York region. It's one of six regions we have across the country, and we cover from New Jersey all the way up to Maine and everything in between in Puerto Rico. So I assume you're including Vermont and New Hampshire, which is what CFP covers. Cool. And, and Puerto Rico. And I'm Puerto Rico, happy. yeah. So not, Florida doesn't get that, you get no, it. No, and believe it or not, a lot of the federal agencies, they have it with the Boston region. We used to have a Boston region that covered Vermont and New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and they also had Puerto Rico. And then when we went down to six regions back in 2012, New York inherited all of the Boston region. So that's why we have Puerto Rico. Oh, excellent. So you're, you're pretty busy. Yes. And so uh, we were very excited that it's census year. And I know that there's a lot going on and people are very distracted at the moment with health and public health. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have them sort of redirect them and talk for a moment about the all important census. So I got something in the mail. Can I show Yay. you? <laughs> and then I didn't fill out my census. So then I got a second reminder. So I was wondering if you could tell us about the flyer and what the intent is. Yeah, so we're really excited about this is the first census in our nation's history. Again, we do this once every 10 years as required by the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 2. And this is the first time that every household across the nation, if they choose, they want to, they'll have the ability to go online and fill out their 2020 census. And that's the invitation that we sent out. In majority of the country, in 80% of the country, the mailer that came out was your uh, invitation to go online with your census ID. Every um, address has a unique census ID. Very cool, yeah. I, I covered um, it up so no one could go on for me. <laughs> That's good. Uh, and basically, it's just, it's just a replacement for your address. That's all it is. So that when you're about to enter that information online, we know exactly where it belongs because it's so important how this data is gonna be used for the next 10 years. We have to make sure when we're releasing the data in a statistical summary by a county, by a census tract, by a city, by a town, that we're doing it in the right one. And that's what that census ID helps us helps us to do. So, And also in there, you should have received a list of 13 different toll-free telephone numbers. Let's one see. One for each language um, that we support. I, I, have to, I have to tell you, I was very impressed you have... Um, Tagalog, which I am sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, but the Philippine Islands language, I was yeah. shocked to see that as well as Polish, French, Haitian Creole, as opposed to just French, it's the Haitian Creole, yep. Japanese, Portuguese, Spanish, Chinese. So you are really, and more, um, so yeah. you're really covering um, a lot of the um, community. Yeah, we're, we're trying to, and, and in addition to having a dedicated toll-free phone number. So if you call the Polish line, someone who speaks Polish is going to answer the phone and immediately converse with you in Polish. But also online, each one of those languages are online. So when you go on to the, the main webpage, when you log on at, at my2020census.gov, you'll see at the bottom a list of, of those languages. And you just click on a language and automatically the, the uh, internet, the, the device or the, the questionnaire will switch into that particular language. Excellent. So let me just back up. It's with no breaks, it's my, M-Y, uh, 2020 census, C-E-N-S-U-S, dot gov? That's correct. That's cool. it. Or you, can, or you can go to our main page at 2020census.gov, see all the different promotional materials we have. We have uh, language guides in 59 languages. We have videos in each of those 59 languages. If you want to see how to fill it out online, maybe you have some questions and just want to see it. There's an eight-minute YouTube video in 59 different languages, as well, as well as American Sign Language. So you can see how easy it is to fill it out online. So speaking of time, so how long is it going to take us? That sounds a little scary if it's an eight-minute video just to explain how to uh, fill yeah. something out. Yeah, part of that video also talks about why it's so important and how easy it's going to be. But it really is a brief. This is a short form only census. We say roughly 10 minutes or so. It depends on the, the size of your household. But it's very basic information we ask. We ask for your name and your phone number. 
We ask for a phone number in case we need to follow up. If there's a quality issue that we want to make sure we're, we're getting the data as accurate as possible. We ask for your, uh, your, uh, your uh, age and your date of birth. We ask for your race and ethnicity, whether or not you're of Hispanic origin. We ask for your sex. You ask for your tenure, whether you own or rent your home. And then we ask for the relationship uh, to the first person who you list on your response, on your census uh, questionnaire, like mother, father, son, daughter, roommate. Uh, and that's it. That's all the data that we're asking for. It's really important to note, no citizenship no question. Citizenship. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, it's, I didn't uh, mean to talk over you. So no, no, no. it again so everyone hears. Yeah, there is no citizenship question on the 2020 census. This is truly a short form census. That's excellent, because I know this is an issue for many people. They're just concerned about that sort of privacy. So, um, so I fill out the census. So there's no follow-up unless I've confused the, um, the document in some way. Right. There, there's a question we ask, how many people live at this address? And let's say you, you put down three, but when you're filling out your form, you only list information for two people. We want to know which is right. Is it really three or is it two? So we may call you back. We prefer to call you, you know, just briefly ask you a question, you know, uh, which one is correct. Are there really three people living there or are there only two? So I'm a little confused on a personal level. My parents may come and live with me in two months. So, um, they will be permanent residents here, but I will fill out the census beforehand. So since I anticipate them moving here, I want my state of Vermont to get that, those numbers as opposed to the lovely state of New Jersey. So <laughs> is, it, is it inappropriate? Because how long you've lived there is one of the questions, right? Yeah, so it really is, ba the census is, ba we're taking a snapshot in time. And that, that reference point is April 1st of 2020. So whether you fill it out, you know, March 25th, or you fill it out July 1st, we're asking who lived at that address as of April 1st, 2020. So okay. if that's where your usual residence is, you know, we, we know some people may have two homes. They have a home in Vermont, and, but they also go to Florida, you know, during the winter months. If they spend most of their time in Vermont, we want them to fill out that form with all their information. We still want them to fill out their Florida form, but we want them to put that zero people usually live there because they usually live in Vermont. Oh, I see. So if I have two residences, I fill it out for the one that <clears throat> you use the services in the state the most. Correct. And then I put zero on my vacation home. Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's where, you, where you usually live or stay or where you uh, stay most of the time as of April 1st, 2020. So if you're looking at a year period, if you spend you know, seven months out of the year in Vermont and five months in Florida, according to our criteria, your census data, you should be counted in Vermont. And the reason why we wanna do the Florida one as well is so the poor census takers don't have to keep stalking you because they know the address of this. <laughs> That's right, because we need a response from every address. So right now we're in the self-response phase. You know, as early as in, in May, we're going to start knocking on doors and that, that could move dependent, you know, based upon our, our current environment. But we're going to knock on the door of every address in which we have yet to receive a census response. So the, the best way to ensure that you don't have someone from the census knocking on your door is to respond either online, over the phone, or if, when you get your paper form to fill it out and mail it back in. That's very helpful. Yeah, we don't want them to come to the door because then you're worried about also fraud, which sort of le Absolutely. leads. So we might as well just talk about that. Fraud is always an issue. Um, so if I get something that looks very similar to this in the mail and directs me someplace else, I really need for it to just be my my 2020 census.gov is where the where I need to be landing. When, so we should check the um the address at the top i guess absolutely you, you definitely want to check the url address there's always scams every decade around the census because we do touch every household across the country so we, we tell people you know we have partners uh, whether it's a church or or a business owners or community-based organizations that want to link to our website we tell them link to 2020census.gov because you go to our main website, there's a whole bunch of information that talks about the census and promotional materials. And there's a button there that says, take the census. You click on that button and it takes you directly to my2020census.gov. Good. Some yeah. important things to note about, as I mentioned, this is a short form only census. Just as important to know the questions we ask, it's important to know the questions we will not ask. 
And in particular, we never ask for a social security number. We never ask for bank account or credit card information. We never ask for money. And we never ask for anything on behalf of a political party. If you see those questions or someone's asking you for that information and they're tying it to the census, it is a scam. And so do we, would we call, they always say contact the authorities, but you wonder what the authorities, do you contact the police? Yeah, what you can do is we actually, on our main webpage uh, on 2020census.gov, we have a fraud and scams link. And you can go on there and there's a toll-free number where you can call, you can do an employment verification. Let's say someone from the census is knocking on your door and you want to make sure they're really a census employee. You can call that toll-free number and we will verify that yes, indeed, or no, that is not a Census Bureau employee that who's out there knocking on your door. Um, we, what we do at the census when we get that call is we alert the local law enforcement to let them know a scam is going on. I mean, first we'll do the research. We'll make sure it truly is a scam. It could be a legitimate survey that's being done by a, you know, a private organization, but, but we want to find that out. So if you call us, we'll do the research. We'll, we'll um, call the local law enforcement. We call the local media. And then most importantly, we activate our partner network. And we have over 330,000 partners nationwide, church leaders, business owners, community-based organizations, elected officials. We reach out to those community leaders to say, hey, there's a scam in your, in your neighborhoods. Please reach out to your community members any way you can to let them know that the scam is going on. Excellent. Wow, that's very thorough. I'm pleased. So you, um, before we started, you mentioned that there's a scam already that's connected to the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. We, we just learned and we have it. We also have a rumors page on our website. It's, it's uh, right next to the scams webpage. And it talks about some of the things you may be hearing on social media some rumors that are out there. And there was a rumor being spread on social media that um, the, if Congress passes a, a stimulus package based upon the COVID-19 um, concerns and, and response, that you have to fill out your census in order to get a check. And that has, we have nothing to do with, with uh, you know, any stimulus package or money that's being received. It is not tied to a census. It is important for you know, future uh, pandemics or things like that, just to know how much, what the population that's affected, if it affects an elderly population to know by state or by county or by city, how many people that, that meet that criteria are there. That's how important the census data and what it could be used for, but it is not tied to individual checks that may be coming from our government. And this department, the um, Census Bureau, would not give information to the other department, federal departments? That's a great point. And, and so we have a census conversation that we, we, we use to, to really teach and educate our, our community leaders, our trusted voices, so that they can go and have this conversation with their community members. We say the census is safe, the census is easy, and the census is important. And we talked about the easy part, you know, being online, being able to call it in over the phone or to fill it out on paper. The safe piece, a lot of people don't realize that there's a, a, a federal law that was put in place in 1954 called Title 13 that basically states that we can never release data at the person or household level. So when we release our information, it, again, it's at a statistical summary, a city, a town, a census tract, a state. It can never be at an address level or a person level. Cool. Local, state, federal law enforcement can never access our data at any time for any reason, which means Homeland Security or ICE can never access our data at any time for any reason. Even the Patriot Act does not supersede Title 13. We've been taken to federal court numerous times over the past seven decades, and we have won every time. This law has never been breached. Knock wood. Yeah, that's right. That's, great. Um, that's really important to know. Um, so uh, I, we were talking about how important it is. So let's talk about how this kind of statistical information can help our local communities and our states. Yeah, it really boils down to two main things, representation and funding. So when we talk about representation, it's at every level of government. The number of seats each state has in the U.S. House of Representatives is based upon the census data. So there'll be a congressional redistricting after the 2020 census. States use this data for their redistricting efforts, for drawing their voting precincts, their school districts. Local communities will use this to determine how many council seats they may have or, or uh, you know, how many members they have in their local governments. 
businesses are going to be using this data for the next 10 years as the foundation of where to grow, where they, if they want to expand, they want to go to some place where they're going to have a customer base, where they're going to be able to hire employees. So businesses will use this data. But probably the biggest selling point we have with communities, and, and then certainly with the partners that we have throughout New Hampshire and Vermont, is when we talk about the hundreds of billions of dollars of federal funding that's disseminated every year based upon formulas that use census data. This is money for Medicare and Medicaid. This is money for National School Lunch Program or Head Start or Title I grants. This is money to fix roads or uh, help uh, expand mass transit systems. So we tell people, don't think of this as a, a government activity that's taking place. Think about this as it helping to ensure you have enough police officers in your community, that you have enough hospital beds in your local hospitals, that you have emergency services that can come and help you, that your roads are fixed, that they're wide enough, that you have enough buses if you have transit in your community, that the elderly are being taken care of, that you have enough health care systems in your community. That's what the census is about. Just a small thing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And hey, we only do it once every 10 years. So, I mean, we, we get one opportunity and it really will affect our communities for the next 10 years. In our area, we have a free bus system that runs along a couple of our um, communities. And we also have a small airport that everyone depends upon. So I'm sure this affects funding for those. Absolutely. Absolutely does. And they're using that data to plan. I mean, local governments business planners are using this information to determine do they need to expand. And when you think about it, a great example I like to use is I talk about a school. And let's say in your local community, you have a school. And let's just say for simplicity, uh, simplicity sakes, you have 100 students in that school. Let's say only 80 of them get counted in the 2020 census. For the next 10 years, that school is going to get 80% of the funding it deserves whether that's for the National School Breakfast Program, whether it's supplies or technology in the classrooms, whether that's the classroom size. And it doesn't just affect those 20 kids who weren't counted, it affects all 100 kids. Now apply that to your community, you know, where you live and what's important to you, whether that's healthcare or whether that's uh, Head Start, whether that's Medicare or, um, you know, fixing the roads or the transit systems, as you mentioned earlier. We have to work together to ensure that everyone gets counted in the 2020 census. This is very important. So what I'm interested, so we talked about fraud. Let's talk about when um, May or later, depending on what's going on out in the communities about social distancing, I guess somebody could come to your door and still stand back and ask you questions. Um, yep. you, don't, you don't have to sign anything. You don't have to touch them in, in any way. Absolutely not. Yeah, our enumerators that will train, of course, we'll train them on, on social distancing. <clears throat> Even the training that we're doing, we're do doing it virtually now, so we don't have to bring people together in a classroom-style setting uh, to teach them how to do this job. So we're, we're completely uh, you know, changing how we're going to train up to 500,000 people nationwide to go knock on doors for a very short-term operation. That operation, all they're doing is they're asking the very same questions that someone could fill out online over the phone uh, or, or fill out on paper and mail it back in. And they'll be carrying a smartphone because they'll be collecting the information on a smartphone that we provide to them. Um, and oh, so they'll be collecting it on the phone. That's interesting. Correct. They don't Correct. even have to write. Correct, yeah, it's just an application. And again, it's the exact same questions that are available online. Um, they'll also be uh, have a, a picture ID. They'll have an official Commerce Department badge with a Commerce Department seal on it so you know that they're official. They'll be carrying around some, some documentation from the Census Bureau that explains our privacy laws. And they also have a little reminder card, like you know when the UPS guy stops by and, and maybe you're not there or a FedEx driver, he leaves a little note. If we knock on the door and no one's there, we're gonna leave a little note. And on that note, we're gonna give you your, remind you of your, your unique Census ID, that 12 digit ID, so that if you still wanna go online and fill it out, you can. Or if you still wanna call it in over the phone, you can. Or if you still have that paper questionnaire, you can still fill it out, mail it back in. And so how do I know if that little sheet of paper is not, um, and it, like, let's say I wanted to do the census over the phone. Uh, how do I know fraud wise, like, like what, you know, it could say U.S. Census Bureau and then have a number that's not 
you know, a scam number. Sure, sure. So our numbers right now are posted on our website at 2020census.gov. So that's the best place to find information. In addition, you can see exactly sample intro letters like the package you got that you showed earlier. We have intro or uh, samples of that so you so people can see exactly what it looks like the placement of the ID, you know, what the, the wording looks like, the, the very specific. We'll do something similar when we get to the point of, of knocking on doors. We'll explain exactly what we're doing, the information that, that we're leaving. Uh, but, but again, let's not even get to that point. If people would just go online or, or call that phone number today, we don't have to worry about knocking on their door in a few months. Okay. But let's talk about for a second. Um, do you, it might be difficult for you to find, or did you call them numerators or enumerators? Yeah, they, enumerators, they're called, yep. The person who walks from door to door. I mean, it's a nice gig, right? I mean, they get paid pretty well. I know around here, at first I saw it for sixteen fifty an hour, and now it's up to $20, $20 an hour, and you yep. could do it part-time, on your own time. I mean, can you tell us anything else about that? Yeah, we, it, we really think this is the best gig job we have in America right now, uh, only because you truly choose your schedule. We ask you basically for the next five days, what days are you available to, to work and what hours for each one of those days? And then we're going to give you an assignment to match that. So we're telling people who, who want to work on a census, don't quit your day job. These are short term temporary jobs. They last about eight to 10 weeks per operation. The longest operation we do is when we knock on doors to collect the information. It's called non-response follow-up. That'll take about anywhere from you know eight to twelve weeks in length. And again, everyone gets to choose their schedule. So, How you? So, so could I work Saturday and I have a full-time job? Can I work Saturday and Sunday? And is that sufficient? Or are you looking for people who can work more hours? Absolutely. So typically we'll start with hiring those people who give us more hours, but we know in this economy, there's a lot of people who can't give us 40 hours a week. So we're hiring people who can give us 10 or 15 hours a week, especially in their, if they're in a community where they have a particular language skill or they're, they're part of a very diverse community and we want to make sure that we're getting, you know, people, we're hiring people that match the community in which they're working. And so if I'm interested, somebody's listening, um, I go to um, 2020census.gov and there'll be information about how to become an enumerator? Absolutely. 2020census.gov, there's a jobs link. You click on that. There's information that you pay rate by, by county, uh, type of job skills. And then there's a button that says apply for, uh, uh, apply for a job. You just click on that button. It takes about 20 minutes. Uh, to fill out an application. We don't ask for previous work history or anything like that. The hardest part of filling out your application is creating a unique password. We have a lot of, you know, stringent thing, policies in place. That's because that account that you're creating will be used throughout the life cycle of your employment with the U.S. Census Bureau. So um, we'll be sending you emails and updates and, and paperwork to fill out. Um, so it's important that you create a password that that uh, you're going to remember. But that that really is the toughest thing, and then you're you're set to go. One uh, one application is good for the life cycle of the 2020 census. Excellent. Is there any other information you think that uh, the general population should know? Yeah. So we talked a lot about the the census conversation that the census is safe, about Title 13, and data can never be used against anyone talked about how easy it is, the online, over the phone, on paper. We talked about the importance. And we're asking people in 2020, not, we, we want everyone to fill out their form and, and pledge to fill out their census form. But we're also asking them to have that census conversation with their neighbors or with their family, at their place of employment, at their house of worship. Talk about the census. We need everyone to be talking about the census because that's the only way we get the trusted voices to, to really educate community members who have never heard of this. Maybe they're new to the country or new to the area. Maybe they're just, you know, they're, they're um, you know, in college and this is the first time they've really had to fill out the census because it's always been done by the parents. The more people we can get talking about it, the, the better the chances are that we're going to get a complete and accurate count. Well, I appreciate talking about it. I think that it's a, something easy enough to do while everyone is staying in place. Um, and I appreciate your time. And as a matter of fact, what I'm gonna do now is 
I'm going to go fill out my census. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it was my pleasure. And um, this is another episode of A Closer Look. We hope you come back. Jeff, come back. If you have additional information you want to tell the community, please. Bye, everybody. Thank Stay you. safe.